And we're live. Oh. I'm really glad everybody could join us. Uh, we were just talking. Uh, the reason we're doing this is because, as everybody knows, NorwestCon did not happen. We were very sad not to be able to get together and talk on panels and talk with the people in the room. So we thought we'd get together virtually and create a small recording of what we would have liked to say. And I'm gonna actually ask uh, everybody to on the panel to introduce yourself and uh, I will start. I'm Charlotte Lewis Brown. I am a paleontologist. I teach dinosaurs and history of life and all sorts of geology classes at a community college here in Washington State. And I'm also the author of a bunch of children's books about dinosaurs. Uh, those are for kids and a bunch of science articles for adults. Jake, I'm gonna pick on you next. Jake McKenzie, high school science teacher. I've taught every topic there is at one point in time or another in the science realm. Right now I'm teaching astronomy and introductory chemistry. And we're Ricky, just, you're up. Yeah, Ricky. <laughs> uh, I, on the internet, I go by Dr. Ricky. I am a research scientist uh, working on microbiology, and I love using food as a way to teach science. Uh, Tracy, you're up. I'm Tracy Furutani. I teach physics um, at a community college in Washington, not the same one as uh, Charlotte's. Um, however, uh, um, I've only been teaching physics for a little while and I'm almost just been pulled in off the street, so I have no idea what to expect here. <laughs> I'm also gonna uh, just say a little bit, we've got a, a fantastic waterfall in the background. Ricky, could you just tell folks <laughs> what that is? Uh, this background here is, uh, the, uh, is a structure in the Singapore Changi International Airport and it's called the Jewel. And it, the key point of the jewel is a, an indoor waterfall. This is the top of that waterfall. Uh, if we do this again, I'll probably choose different angles of that waterfall so you can see it. It just looks very biological, so I love that background. Yeah. Uh, so what we're gonna do is everybody on the panel is gonna present our favorite weird fact uh, about science. Uh, speak for a little bit. Uh, panelists will have a discussion back and forth and then we'll move on. And uh, I'll just say we have one guinea pig audience member uh, down below, which might show up in uh, some of the screen recordings, but the audience uh, will not participate quite yet. Jake, let me get the screen sharing up uh, to show the beautiful pictures that you had for us and, and then you will take it away. Hopefully. In theory. Yes, in theory. I'm going to stop that screen share and try that again. Okay. All right. As a, as, a, as a biology person, first and foremost, I was always amazed by the insect life on the planet. And of the insect life on the planet, the Ichneumonidae, they're a parasitoid wasp family. So they live by, para by being parasites and other animals. And they're part of the order Hymenoptera, which is your typical wasps. Um, the Ichneumonidae themselves, 40 subfamilies, 25,000 species minimum with finding new ones every year. Uh, they, with almost no except, with, um, with very few exceptions, they attack immatures and full grown insects and spiders and inject their eggs inside the eggs hatch, the babies eat their way out. Um, they regulate insect and spider populations and have actually been considered for organic pest control. Historically speaking, they were one of the first things that made Darwin question the existence of God. The reason being in one of his letters from 1860, he wrote, I own that I cannot see as plainly as others do and as I should wish to do the evidence of design and benefit to all sides there is so much misery in the world and I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designed and created the Ichneumonidae with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of animals or that a cat should play with mice. So let's talk about this pretty little lady in front of us. This. this is the jewel wasp. 
Ampulexa compressa, part of the subfamily Ampulicidae. Uh, solitary wasp lives by itself. It's termed an entomophagous parasite, meaning it parasitizes wait, wait, wait. It lives, insects. It lives by itself? Yep, yep. It's by socially itself. distancing? Very. It's, it's perfect <laughs> for this, right? <laughs> yes. Um, the only time it ever gets with other wasps is to um, reproduce. I, I'm just going to interrupt real quick. So we're talking like inspiration for the alien movie here. To an extent, yes, it is. It is the 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 Ichneumonidae were one of the ideas that gave the idea for this, for the alien movies. Um, the jewel wasp in particular, though, we should love it because it parasitizes one particular insect, and that's the cockroach. It's the only one it parasitizes. Now it has a sting, but the sting is actually an insertion device as well, and it uses it to attack the cockroach. Now this is where it gets really weird. The wasp lands on the cockroach and it stings it twice. The first time it stings it at the thorax or the waist of the cockroach. And this sting immobilizes the legs. It stuns the nervous system. The poison stuns the nervous system so that the cockroach can't run away. And then the wasp spins around and tags this cockroach right at the base of the head, right at the control center for the roach brain. Now this is, this is really amazing when we think about it because that second sting puts just enough of the poison in to basically destroy a part of the roach's brain. Hmm. And this destruction causes the roach to pause and literally begin cleaning itself. Hmm. It just sits there and it, it cleans itself for about 15 or 20 minutes. And the wasp just kind of sits and watches. Once the cockroach is done, the wasp literally gently grabs the cockroach by the antenna. If you take a look at our next picture here, we've got a picture of a different little guy here leading his cockroach, her cockroach, her. I should say, down to a burrow that she's already dug out close by. The cockroach is walking and- Yes. Ah, so not dragging it as in- No. Oh, weird. No, it's, it's like a zombie that's just being carried along and it, it's, and the wasp just kind of pulls it and it goes, oh, okay, I'll, I'll go with you. And well, it, well to, be, to be honest, like we, ha we have uh, put electronics on cockroaches so we can oh, remote control them. Oh, so, yeah. It's not, it's not like it, that's weird. Okay, we no. go. <laughs> but so it takes it, so the wasp takes it down and takes it down into this hollowed out hole. And that's when it lays its egg on it. Right below the wings covers, you can see there, it inserts the, the ovipositor underneath there and lays the egg right underneath the wings. And then it leaves the burrow, covers it up. The egg hatches, and the larva burrows into the cockroach's body. Now, what's crazy here is that the sting that the, that the wasp originally gave to the brain system of the cockroach seems to not numb the cockroach, but make it so that it doesn't care about things, to put it in a weird sort of humanic, human way. From what we can tell from um, electronically, you know, recording stuff, the, the cockroach can feel the larva wasp burrowing into its body. The larva wasp then eats its way through the body, somehow avoiding all of the vital organs so that the cockroach stays alive. The cockroach, from what we can tell from the pain receptors in the brain, feels this, but it just doesn't have the motivation to do anything or try to get away. It just sits there in, the, in, the, in this little hole and is eaten from the inside out. And by the time the wasp is ready to mature and burst its way out, as we can see with the last slide, there she comes, or he comes, doesn't matter, either one male or female, and they pop their way out of the cockroach's body, and ta-da. Wait, so, this so you why need Darwin, one. So we this need is why one Darwin cockroach? was so freaked out. Huh? One, one cockroach per kid? Yep. Yep. That's a lot of cockroaches to catch. Oh, yeah. These, these things are very efficient hunters. Any um, of these? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, what, what, what were you thinking? Uh, as I remember, some of there are wasps that do this to small animals. As I mean, this is an animal, but uh, birds and or mammals. No, the only thing these wasps are all insect and spider. There's nothing that does this to a 
to my knowledge, there's nothing that we know of zoologically where a wasp does this to a higher organism. Uh, yeah, I, I think the tarantula hawk does that for, for spiders. Um, yep, it does that. There's yeah, those big blue black ones that fly around down yeah. in the southwest United yeah. States. Wait, wait, blue black birds or blue black spiders? Wasp. Wasp. There are these wasps are about four inches long. Ooh. They're, are they, oh, they're not quite that big. <laughs> well, with the with the ovipositor and everything else, yeah. I mean, they're they're look, yeah, they're, they're they look they're four big. inches long. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Uh, it's that optical inch. It's a guy thing. Don't mind me. Yeah, it is definitely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but yeah, there you go. There's my uh, there's my weird thing for the day. Well, so you were saying it, it was not exactly the inspiration for Alien. You want to speak a little bit more to that? Well, the thing about it is, is the one of the the reason it's not exactly the thing is because the from what we can tell, the cockroach just dies as this emergence happens there's no you know if you think back to the first alien movie the guy's like eating his lunch and all of a sudden ah i can ah ah blah, you know it's like it's not wait i want you to do those sound effects again <laughs> i'm very good i am i am amplifying that one on the edit okay <laughs> thanks ricky thank god my picture's not up <laughs> but yeah so that's yeah it, it's it's not a it because it doesn't because we don't have any of these that parasitize mammals, that's why it's not exactly like the alien. Well, you got to have you know, a little bit of fictional license, right? Well, yeah, yeah of course. So what I'm wondering here is that, uh, you know what is an interesting mammal here is the guy who studied the pain receptors. Like, so here you're literally watching a wasp that's, I mean, a, a cockroach is being eaten from the inside. And your question scientifically is, what is it feeling? <laughs> well you know i mean we've i mean i back in college one of the cockroaches were one of the main things we used because they're so hardy and they're so hard to kill um you know yeah you, but you never asked what is it feeling <laughs> well you know <laughs> is the brain of the cockroach uh you said it sort of par paralyzes it is it is it still there and just chemically Maybe it he's seems, a little bit it, high, or does he like actually melt part of the brain? It seems like the only part of the brain it destroys is the part that controls fight, fight and flight. And, and by destroy, you mean it's like physically eaten by chemicals? Well, kind of, just like stuns or destroys that part of the brain so the cockroach doesn't have any reaction to run away from anything. It's totally, it's, it's you know, if, if the wasp, didn't finish its job and take it into the tunnel, the cockroach would just sit there and look around like, hey, and a bird could come down and eat it. It wouldn't react when you walk up to it. Nothing. It's just like, oh, wow, cool. It's like so silly. I mean, you know, totally out of it. The control of like uh, um, other critters is uh, not just unique to these guys, right? There's one that infects us called toxoplasma. That's the one ah. that's like a bug basically, uh, your cat can give you. Yeah, it actually uh, makes you more of a risk taker. It uh, modifies you neurologically. So yeah. there's a lot of weird stuff like that out there. <laughs> there's that's actually part, a wasp. That's there's a wasp that, There's a wasp that does that to a different species of uh, uh, cottonwood borer. That actually the the secretions the wasp puts off actually adjust the DNA of the wasp. You might like that one, Ricky. Uh, always. Well, um, before we move on, I, uh, I got a note from Tracy who pointed out a slight copy and paste error. I wanted to attribute all of the photos. The wild photos uh, on the po photograph is correct, but it's not the standard model image credit down below. I want to be accurate about that. You'll see another image that's correct for that. Okay. Anybody have comments before I move on to something ancient? I'm good. Okay. Go for it. Um, I want to talk about dinosaurs. Since I'm a paleontologist, uh, frankly, one of the most exciting things I've seen has been new discoveries, a lot of them coming out of uh, new quarries out of China in the last couple of decades, including the feathered dinosaurs. And then there are these things. These are not 
made up. They're reconstructions, but they are based on actual fossils. And one of the fascinating things I've seen is the variety of dinosaurs that have adaptations for flight. Possibly not powered flight, like we see, uh, we see a guy taking off here. They might have been gliders, but what you're looking at on the right there, uh, nicknamed bat-winged dinosaurs. They actually have elongated hands and fingers and membrane, probably. A little bit controversy about how much membrane, but it looks like they have membrane in between their fingers like a bat, and then feathers covering their body. And they're part of the small carnivorous dinosaur related to uh, T-Rex and things like that, the theropods. And then the guy on the right, Microraptor, he was discovered almost 20 years ago now. And he actually has elongated flight feathers on all four limbs. So probably, again, a small predator could jump up uh, and glide in between trees, steer probably a little bit better than a flying squirrel, but not flapping flight. And one of the things I love about Microraptor is he broke a rule. When I was uh, a kid, I was told we never know what color the dinosaurs were for sure. We know that that's an accurate color reconstruction of Microraptor, at least some species. The feathers are well enough preserved, we can do microscopic analysis of the residue and confirm that they were iridescent black like crows. Hmm. I got one more thing about dinosaurs, I'm going to open things up. Uh, the other half of this, besides having a lot of cool dinosaurs discovered, is some reinterpretations. So the giant arms you see here were discovered in Mongolia in the 1970s. And that's all we found of the animal at first. They could tell from the structure and from the claws that it was a relative of the of T-Rex, a carnivorous dinosaur family. And in initial reconstructions were just a giant predator with scaled up to these huge arms. Well, a few years ago, we found more complete skeletal material. There's an interesting uh, detective story there as some of the material had been sold on the black market and had to be relocated and then scientifically studied. And on the right, you see two different reconstructions of this. He had a hump like a camel. Um, so up above, you see one paleo artist actually envisions him as a camel colored coat. Um, I think that's probably a little bit fanciful, but I just love that picture. He's got waddles like a chicken due to the bird relatives. Um, down below, it's a little bit more sedate, but you see that, that hump. Uh, again, that's not bone, that's a structure supported uh, like the uh, fat hump on a camel. And they didn't have big teeth. He's got a narrow head. He was probably an omnivore, um, certainly not a pure carnivore. Maybe even like pandas evolving back towards herbivore. Still a pretty big guy, right? Yes, yes. Now the scale was right. All right. But, uh, and actually the claws, uh, if you closer look at them, Instead of being really sharp claws for, you know, clawing out a throat, they were uh, probably more likely for uh, digging up vegetation, digging up roots. Some controversy about that, but not, not sharp killing claws. Mm. And I wanted to just throw up those weird pictures and, and point out one of the fun things is we've had Hollywood take up a lot of dinosaur movies, the Jurassic World um, franchise started out as Michael Crichton very wedded at least to the idea that everything had to be scientifically possible. They took real theories about dinosaurs, not necessarily proven theories, but real theories about what could exist uh, and limited themselves to that in the first Jurassic Park movie. Velociraptors are really only that, what, I'm trying to show you, about <laughs> that big, about the size of a turkey. Mm. But we do have other animals in the same family that are six feet tall, for example. Well, um, by, the, by the time Jurassic World came towards the end, I mean, they just threw all, all pretense of science out the window. That was exactly my point. 
<laughs> and they're changing themselves because this stuff is weirder than anything and cooler than anything Hollywood has come up with. And they haven't even, pre they aren't even pretending to be scientific now. <laughs> well, I, I tell you something, I've often told my students, don't ever go to Hollywood for your science. They do have it's, great graphics though. It's the worst thing when, you know, someone says, ah, here, I did my research, I saw it on YouTube, like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hey, take a, can you go back one slide? Yeah. Because I wanted to point this out, this is really cool. Uh, so these bat-winged dinosaurs, um, these are non-avian uh, yeah. dinosaurs, and it's it's really cool because uh, if you look at all the avian uh, the, the birds that we know of, the wing structure, the, the way the wing bones splay out are almost all the same, and these are distinctly different. In order to get that, so this is sort of the point that people out that um, feathers exist even in the non-avian lineage. So what you're saying is that these are, I mean, when I look at this, this looks more like a bat's wings than, or a, uh, a pterodactyl's wings than a bird's wings. Is that what you're saying? Sort yeah. of. Um, I'll, and, and thank you for pointing that out, because uh, I, I want to go in a little bit more detail. That was one of the things I was trying to say, is uh, what they all share, carnivores and birds, they have lost three digits. So they only have three or less fingers. And let me just make sure you guys can see my pointer here. Is that correct on the screen? Yeah. Yes, yes, we can see. Here we have one finger, two finger, three finger, but they're all discrete fingers. Um, and then we've got sort of a bone spur here, three claws. It's a little bit hard to tell from the way this is drawn exactly what they meant this to represent. Um, this guy also, he's got one, two claws here, and there's another third longer finger. Modern birds have all fused those fingers together. Yeah. So I'm it's really, yeah. It's it, sort of an interesting thing to point out that this is a, something the losing three fing, losing two fingers is a common feature between this and a related creature because uh, it's easier to lose something than to gain a new feature in evolution. Well, that's a typical thing when you're uncareful in a shop class, too. <laughs> and, and that, too. <laughs> so it's easier to break something than it is to build something new, even in shop class. Yep. But if people have, if, uh, if they've, lost they, they've lost fingers in the same fashion, then they more likely share the same common ancestor. Well, and, uh, and bats, it looks like a bat wings, but bats still have all five fingers. Exactly. Right. And uh, pterodactyls, the, the reptiles, what they've done is they've taken their, their fourth finger and elongated it and put a membrane on it. So totally inter different internal structure. And this is yet a, a, what, a fourth and a fifth way of building a wing. So, so, what you're saying, so what you're saying is there is that these, the extension, the end of this wing is the forefinger, whereas on a pterodactyl, it's the little finger. Um, the, say that again, Jake. So when you look at the, when you look at the dinosaur here on the screen, where your pointer is at the very end, that's right. the end of the forefinger. Is that what you're saying? Um, you know, I'd have to stop and count. Uh, the port, the pointer finger. Well, so that would be like the pointer finger, but you're saying a pterodactyl is the extension is the little finger. The extension is a little finger, whether or not this is, uh, the, homologous structure to, to the, uh, yeah, I forget, I'm pausing because I forget whether they've lost their thumb and their pinky or, you know, whether it's the last three fingers. Um, I okay. think, I think it's the fifth and the fourth digit, but somebody's going to correct me in the comments, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but if you look internally, the structure is different for all of these different wings. Flight invertebrates has evolved more than once. Powered flight maybe only evolved twice with the birds and the pterodactyls. But given you know, a lack of extinction, I think these guys would have given those animals for a run for the money. Cool. Tracy, what were you holding? Um, we're gonna, you wanna take it away, Tracy, unless there's any other comments or questions? Like something. I wanted to see what it was. Oh, Ricky? Yeah. Yeah, you were holding up something, Ricky, towards the screen. 
Oh no, I I I was just checking to see who was on the, what what Tracy wrote in the chat. Oh, okay. Your turn, Tracy. Take it away. Um, just picking something randomly from the world of physics. Um, you know, uh, a lot of good ideas get into science fiction stories, and uh, you know everything from the accelerating expansion of the universe to you know what's the end of time like, what's the end of the universe like. There's never been, at least in my experience, a good book about the standard model of particle physics, and partially because it's insane, but um, it's and it's really fairly complicated. But um, I just wanted to ask, pose this one question. Okay, so. This, this, these set of building blocks here are effectively what makes up all of what we know about. So there's all kinds of different ways you can slice them up. There's like uh, bosons and hadrons and things like that. This so it's gotta be on a t-shirt somewhere. We've got to put this on a t-shirt. This the, is everything. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what's interesting to me is basically that um, that first column, including the up-down quarks, the electron, neutrino, and electron, that's like the first family. It's uh, called that because um, they're like the smallest. Um, they always uh, weight uh, particles in terms of mega electron volts, the equivalent in energy. And so this is like the smallest number, all four of these guys. You go the next one over, charm strange, muon neutrinos, muons, um, second generation. They're basically about a hundred times more massive than the first generation. And then that third family, top, bottom, tau neutrinos and taus, these are basically the most weighty. They are basically the, uh, um, about a, a thousand times, basically what the first generation is like. So the order of discovery is pretty straightforward. We kind of figured out the first generation pretty early on with the very crude uh, atom smashers that we had back in the 40s and 50s. And then it took until the 60s and 70s to get the second family. And then I think we finally found top in the 90s at some point. So 95. Basically, uh, each of these uh, families required more and more energy in the collisions to generate them so that we could actually see these things. Now, way over on the right side are these things called force carriers. And that's how any of these particles in the left side know that they exist with a relationship to each other. So in other words, how does an up communicate with a down? Well, it has to basically go through something like a gluon, which basically is another particle that's exchanged between the two. And so there's been a lot of work done on this kind of stuff. And the thing that's fascinating to me about this is why these three families, right? I mean, it could have been any number. It didn't have to be, you know, quantized as it were in that way. It could have basically been just sort of a continuous spectrum of all different masses and things like that. And yet they all fall neatly into these categories. Now, to be fair, it's because we don't really build humongous atom smashers, right? So we can't really see if there's anything heavier than that third uh, column over that I was talking about, the fourth generation, as it were. Um, some people theorize that that actually does exist. But the fact that we can explain almost all of what we see with these six quarks, six leptons, and four force carriers is really fascinating to me that it just sort of fell out neatly that way. And these are called elementary particles because in principle, they're not made of anything further smaller than that. And people talk about string theory and that kind of stuff, and I'm not even gonna go there, right? But, but as far as we know, these are like the last distinct bits of matter, the smallest distinct bits of matter that there are. So I just wanted to kind of share this because, uh, um, you know, it's, to me, it's just kind of interesting how everything, literally all of you know, creation, pretty much basically could be reduced down to this table and the interactions that these particles have with each other. Just a weird little thing. <laughs> Do you think that the, the fact that they are bunched the way they are could be an artifact of the way that we think and have designed machines? I mean, you mentioned that we might not have the big enough machines, but just the way our brains work. Yeah, partially, I, I, you know, humans are notorious pattern finders, right? And so, yeah. I mean, we, we made this table for our convenience, not because nature necessarily made it that way, right? So, so yeah, it's, it, it is true that uh, there is some, um, what is it, anthropomorphizing going on here. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, these uh, energies of these particles are really well known. Um, their interactions are really well known. And yeah, perhaps somebody who's really, really smart, smarter than certainly I am, um, can figure out another way to dice and slice this and put it together. But for now, this really does seem to explain a lot of what goes on in terms of matter. Um, and 
to me, that's really fascinating that you could actually kind of reduce everything down to this. So all of chemistry, all of physics, all of biology kind of comes down to this. So I guess my question for you is, which one of these is the instigator, so to speak, of gravity? Ah, yeah, now that's the um, Higgs boson, the one that was most recently discovered. It's the one of the force carriers over on the right there. Right. And uh, yeah, and it was a direct fallout of the math um, where uh, back in the 60s, I think, uh, it was proposed that there had to be this thing called the Higgs field, named after the person who talked about it, um, that essentially um, it, uh, gives kind of a, a framework on which to hang mass. So, you know, mass is one of those things that we just kind of take for granted, right? You know, I have mass, everything that we see has mass. And the point is that, uh, um, you know, we know that it's made out of atoms. We know that atoms are made out of all this other stuff like electrons and protons and neutrons and stuff. But all that needs some kind of framework to hang on to so that, for instance, something like gravity knows that that mass exists to act upon, right? So if you have like, let's say there's only two things in the universe, right? Me and this car, let's say. Well, how do I know that car exists? It's because the car is tugging me towards it. How does the car know I exist? Well, because basically I'm tugging the car towards me. And the question was basically always, you know, yes, how, do, how, how is anything aware of this? Well, these force carriers on the right side uh, gave an, a, a, you know, essentially like a, um, a method by which we could detect each other. So it's like me throwing tennis balls at the car and the car throwing tennis balls back at me or something. That's how I know that thing exists. But then somebody asked the question, well, how is it that basically you have anything to throw with? In other words, how are you basically flinging these tennis balls? And that that Higgs field is about is this sort of framework on which mass becomes the thing that allows the communication with other particles to occur. So I don't know if I answered your question there, but that's kind of my understanding of it. I mean, I'm, I'm going way off into left field here. So, <laughs> so basically what, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. I mean, it's, it's actually, I think it's an excellent explanation and uh, you, you simplified it well enough. And if I, if I caught what you were saying, Tracy, the one thing that happened here is they weren't just randomly looking. There was a, a missing component from the calculations. So they went looking to what might fill it. Right, I mean, that's what every good theory does, right? It's basically, it makes predictions. And, you know, if there's obviously something that should exist that the theory proposes, of course, that's gonna give you a direction to um, aim your research at. And it doesn't matter whether it's physics or biology or chemistry, you know, it gives you sort of a target and everybody's gonna start looking for it. It may be really hard to find and people may be discouraged because they certainly did for the Higgs boson for quite a long time. But nevertheless, ultimately they found it. So it, that's kind of the nice validation of the theory. I think the hardest thing I, I had with the things like the Higgs boson, like, like the, when the collider was being built, is that um, they have no way of proving that it doesn't exist. I, they, they just have to keep trying. And if they, you know, tried thousands of, you know, how many thousands and they run out of money, well, it probably doesn't exist. But very often it's like, oh, we just haven't built a big enough collider. When do you stop looking? Yeah, never. Uh, the trouble with all science, right, is the fact that, um, you know, it's always the one counter example that can disprove a theory, but you can't ever prove a theory, right? You can just find many, many examples that are consistent with it. And it still doesn't prove anything. It's just that, yeah, it seems to be a reasonable explanation of the facts. But, you know, again, you're right. It's, 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 it, it's a never ending job. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll bring in dinosaurs for comparison. Um, until you actually start looking for something, you may not find it. It was well, hundred more than 150 years after the first recognized dinosaurs were published that they actually found one with feathers. Well, actually, if you go back and look a little bit more carefully, now that we had a really convincing a dinosaur with an outline of feathers from the happened in the 1990s people started looking at things that had been found previously including archaeopteryx and thinking maybe maybe you don't want to think about that as a traditional uh, bird maybe it fits in better with some of the non-avian dinosaurs it's it's one of those places where the difference between birds and dinosaurs is getting smaller and smaller and it's getting harder and harder to tell them apart uh, which is one of the reasons why uh, because of their similarities it's one of the reasons why they are uh, 
my many paleontologists regard it as the same thing. Kentucky yeah. Fried Dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dinosaur <laughs> rabbits. Um, we had uh, one, one question from our guinea pig audience uh, for you, Tracy, which was, uh, I'm going to modify it a little bit. What do you think the possibility is that there could be a fourth, fourth field here? Yeah, nothing precludes it. It's just that these are such massive particles. Now, once you get to the fourth generation, the energies are so much bigger that us being able to discover it's going to take another generation of uh, particle colliders. I mean, it really is that massive. So, yeah, nothing, nothing prevents us, um, you know, theoretically from finding these things. It's just sort of more of a practical limitation. See, see that would be a great science fiction story, right? When you reach a structure that's like, can encircle an entire star and all it is is a, it's, it's a particle accelerator. Right. <laughs> Talking about like two civilizations that enclose their whole solar system just to find this thing, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a, di a Dyson Collider. Exactly. A Dyson Collider, exactly. <laughs> Up on that one. <laughs> and you can power it from the entire star itself. I mean, it's brilliant. That's why you build the Dyson Sphere. Right. Wait a minute. What, wasn't that wasn't that in uh, Avengers Endgame? Wasn't that the the, the star that they started up to? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say just just as long as you don't do something to mess up your star while you're doing it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop this share because we had another another PowerPoint that we wanted to pull on up. Um, and while I do that. Uh, I'm going to throw you over to the rest of the panel to be say something amusing about what we're doing. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> no, no our, our timing is really good. Like this is about, we're about a couple of minutes away from somebody walking in with the says, you know, 10 minutes to go sort of thing. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, I got to, I got to stop the, uh, the PowerPoint a slightly different way that we had, but we're going to. By the way, uh, that's a num Sunny Jim, if you ever watch this, we need you for that. <laughs> I forgot to get a hold of her. I knew I was forgetting something this week. I've been so very busy. <laughs> I was late getting to the couch this morning. I don't know what happened. What? <laughs> All right. For fortunately, everyone is dressed like they would be in a con anyway. Well, it's a third. It's going to be posted hopefully on the third day of the con when everybody's just hung over and brain dead anyways, right? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> So we fit right so, in. Exactly. That's how this works. Okay. Um, so I decided that if I'm going to talk about these things, I'm going to dedicate it to things that are spineless. <laughs> uh, it's too easy to talk about things with, with we have a we have vertebrate bias. We like living in vertebrates. So we're going to talk about spineless things. And at least for this one, I'm going to talk about a plant, because most people don't talk about plants. Uh, and this is a seaweed. It's caulerpa. It's pretty common. Um, uh, this, this is a small version of it. The, it comes with different uh, frond structures. Uh, this can grow to about several meters high. Uh, can you uh, go forward a bit? Yes. And uh, yeah. so I first encountered uh, caulerpa uh, because it's edible. You can eat it. Uh, in Japan, they actually uh, put it on sushi, it's oh, omibudo. Uh, we call them sea grapes. Uh, they can be seen in a salad like this. Uh, this should give you an idea of the size of those of, of the fronds. Um, but that's not the only shape, they come in various shapes. And uh, this plant was first observed um, decades ago. And I found this old video uh, describing what's so cool about caulerpa. And uh, if the video will play, let's go go watch it together. We'll have sound for this in just a minute, and you guys will let me know if it uh, is it getting any feedback. You just a heads up to our panelists: you might need to mute your mics if uh, feedback starts echoing. The tropical marine alga, Calerpa, is rather like a small fern. It grows naturally on the seabed, and it may extend for several meters. 
Unlikely though it may seem, the Calerpa plant consists of but a single cell, which contains a great many nuclei. Calerpa shows clearly that a single cell of very large size can possess structural and functional differences similar to those which are to be found in multicellular plants. From an apparent stem or rhizome growing horizontally, root-like structures grow down, while green leaf-like projections or fronds grow up. Since the cytoplasm is continuous throughout the plant, Organelles are free to move from one region to another. The gross movement of chloroplasts, for instance, is seen here in time-lapse as a dark green shadow moving to the left from the tip of the rhizome. All one cell. That is amazing. Growth of the rhizome is restricted to elongation at its tip. This process typifies the mode of root growth of multicellular land plants and is also similar to the growth of pollen tubes. The root-like structures are delicate extensions of the wall of the rhizome. They are analogous to the root hairs of the higher plants. In most land plants, the development of leaves from an apical meristem is obscured from view by bud scales and older leaves. But in Calerpa, the formation of the intricate leaf-like fronds takes place in full view. A tiny protrusion on the upper surface of the rhizome extends to form an erect stalk. From the very tip of this stalk, pairs of flaps resembling leaflets arise in regular synchrony, growing in a single plane. The growth you see here took four days. But remember, you are not looking at a multicellular structure like a fern frond or a pinnate leaf. You are watching a single cell, parts of which are being elaborated into three different shapes, the rhizome, the rootlets, and the leaf-like fronds. Perhaps the principles explaining the development of shape in multinucleate algae and in the higher plants as well may be explored more readily in this organism where the phenomena are displayed in such a dramatic and accessible way. Okay, you can stop there. But so that's the one thing that I want to clear that these are the largest cells in the world. They're several meters in size. And the whole thing is one cell. Is uh, any evidence genetically about when this thing develops? So is it a secondary loss of cell walls from a multicellular organism, or was it never differentiated? It never separates it out into the it's, it's always been, it's one cell with the 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 nuclei divide. So it has there are many nuclei, but they it's not like they merge. Well, but when in geological time did that happen? Oh, oh, um, I don't know. I need to look that up because they don't fossilize that easily. Yeah. Right. So we have to use molecular clock techniques to look back and, and, and try to find it. Um, I'll need to follow that up. I, the, there is some genetic research on them. Um, a lot of it is based on trying to produce the edible variety. Okay. People obviously want that. Uh, and they are tasty, by the way. I, I, I like them. Uh, <laughs> Um, but it, it, what do they, they taste like? Um, chicken. Yes. <laughs> uh, Sorry. <laughs> they're, no, they're small. They're smaller. They're like micro raptor. <laughs> uh, no, they, they're kind of like okra, believe it or not. Oh, God. 
but, but it's because it's straight cytoplasm. Right? There's no, there, there is no cells in between it. it you're, you're eating straight cytoplasm, you're eating yeah. one giant cell. Well, I'm, I'm taking the advantage here. The difficulty with eating plants is that the cell walls are mostly indigestible. Even there's, even, yeah, there's even, one cell wall continuous throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Is it any thicker <laughs> than uh, cell walls like on algae? Uh, no. So it no. should have a higher nutritional value per ounce then uh it's i, I mean it, it's very commonly eaten in uh, so japan and asia they farm it and you know it's, it's a delicacy um i i don't know if it's any there somebody will always be able to say well this is rich in iron or iodine or whatever but uh it's as far as as far as people are concerned it's just something that they like to eat and what I find really fascinating is that it's actually possible to take one cell and yeah. make it this big. Yeah, that's interesting. So what happens when you cut a piece of it off? How does the cell seal itself? That's really fascinating. I think there's some research on that. Um, there is some way of like cutting the bleeding. There are these subcellular uh, uh, emergency, uh, you, you know how like, in Star Trek where these doors just slam shut. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Wow. I'm imagining Jake with a scalpel torturing the plant to see. <laughs> I mean, you could. I'm shocked and offended. Yeah. Well, offended? Not really. <laughs> you not offended? I mean, this, <laughs> this plant is... I wouldn't use a knife or a scalpel. i just eat it. Come on. <laughs> this plant is basically the proto-molecule from the expanse, right? I mean, it's just basically <laughs> just one big blob of stuff. <laughs> it's the exact opposite of the Borg. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, what if life on Earth evolved like this, where everything is one cell? Yeah. Huh. Well, it might improve the IQ of some people. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. Not really. <laughs> Well, I'm trying to imagine multiple nuclei uh, would have to coordinate, otherwise you're going to have multiple uh, control centers. Uh, so there are, multi there are other organisms that are like this, that are one cell with multiple uh, nuclei, and you can do experiments like, you know, you tear, tear off one end of the, of the plant and you inject like a dye or beads on one side and see how long it takes to get to the other side. And if you shine light on one side, what will carry it over? And if you interrupt it on one end, uh, this tells you all the intracellular signals it takes to go from one end to the other. Right. Uh, you yeah. know, kind of like, if you think about it, your neurons are really, really long cells. Like it's one cell from your, you know, from your brain uh, all the way down to the, your spine. Mm -hmm. So Jake has a question. He says, uh, um, have they tried growing this in zero G? Would it grow randomly? I think effectively they grow in zero G underwater, but that's a good question. I don't think we've sent this up on, the, uh, on any of the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. But imagine if you had to send it, you had to send a lot of water to go with it too. It's, it's, it's neutral buoyancy, but it would still have uh, the cues. Uh, for gravity, but my guess would be a... My guess would be light more exactly. than gravity. Yes. Exactly. Okay, that makes sense. So you should, so Jake, if you want to torture it, you shine light all around it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so, somehow that seems like an appropriate note. To on. Uh, we would now be kicked out of the room. Uh, yeah. We're actually at Mare West But, but uh, I have to say, I've had a lot of fun with this. And um, I wanted to just to thank you, everybody, for, for taking part of this. And uh, for our guinea pig audience, say thank you, too. Definitely. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, nobody, nobody sign off yet. I am going to stop the recording. Okay. Um,